Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to summer, apparently. Jay, two weeks ago, it was 40 degrees here, so we're really welcoming our summer weather. So um, my name is Kathy Shader, and I'm a consultant with Marshville Clinic Health System and the Wisconsin After School Network, and I am moderating this series of webinars. We are pleased to be offering this learning series with the Marshfield Clinic Healthcare System and the Wisconsin Department of Administration. Today's webinar is the fourth of a five-part series for day camp programs in the state of Wisconsin. This series was developed in consultation with leadership from the American Camp Association Wisconsin Council of Leaders and the Wisconsin After School Network. We are pleased to have Julia J. Benedith join us to present this morning's webinar, and I will introduce Jay in a moment. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Please keep your microphones on mute. If you have questions, we ask you to post those in the chat box, which the Marshfield Clinic staff will be monitoring. We will be fielding questions at the end unless something really pressing comes up. So if you have an immediate question, feel free to post it. We will interject that where we can. And as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded and will be sent to all registered participants in the next week. Julia J. Benedith is a progressive educator and a passionate equity leader from New York City. Currently, she is the Associate Director of Talent Deve Development at KIPP DC and a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Through Jay Benedith Coaching Services, Julia has facilitates interactive workshops, one-to-one -one coaching sessions, and group coaching programs. Her coaching expertise is helping Gen Zers, millennials, and early career educators manage their mindsets to achieve their goals. Julia is a founding member of the Teach for America ETQ Plus board. She has presented at numerous events, such as the 2021 Kappa Delta Pi, Convocation, the Kellogg Human Development Conference, and the Thriving Teachers Project. She is a contributing writer for Truth for Teachers and Edutopia, as well as a contracted facilitator for Rise to Win and Edwell. Julia lives in Washington, D.C., where she loves to explore museums, lots of good ones there, uh, Julia in D.C., and hike new trails. And uh, Jay, I now turn this presentation over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm super happy to be here. Um, and we get to talk about challenging conversations. Um, and we know that those are the sorts of conversations that sometimes we are not really looking forward to, but we know that they're important to have. Um, so I encourage everyone on this call um, and those of you who are watching at a later time to feel free to take notes um, and to engage as much as possible. So Kathy talked a bit about, about me and I just wanna share just um, a bit more um, that, that's a little more personal. Um, so as Kathy said, I am a native New Yorker and currently I live in Washington, DC. I just moved here like a month ago. <laughs> so it's, it's really new, but it's feeling like home and uh, it is like 70 degrees out here. So I'm, I'm definitely enjoying the weather. Um, I am an educator. I taught for five years in Brooklyn, New York, and I was an instructional coach for three years. And then I founded my small business um, in which I coach educators and I also facilitate workshops. And as Kathy said, I am a, um, a contributing writer for different publications and I'm also a contract facilitator um, for different organizations. Um, and I'm, again, my nine to five is at KIPP DC. And, um, you know, when I think about this work, um, I, I wanna make sure that I'm grounding myself in um, my why. And so I always think about if I don't do this work, who will do this work? Um, and if I don't do this work right now, when will it ever get done, right? So if I keep that in the forefront, then it's really helpful in, you know, building my resilience and maintaining my resilience. And ultimately, my mission is to close the opportunity gap, right? I think that, um, especially in the education world, we talk a lot about the achievement gap, and we've come to realize that that is not really the issue that we need to be tackling, right? We need to tackle the issue of there being opportunity gaps. And then that will then close whatever gaps we are seeing in achievement. And so that is something that I'm always working towards um, in my work. And I didn't say this before, um, but feel free to call me Jay. Um, everyone does. And um, I use the she series for my pronouns. 
So just a quick warm up. Um, I'm wondering which season matches your current mood and why. And I'm unable to see the chat. Um, so Kathy, if you could just share some of the responses that are coming up, that'd be really helpful. Well, I um, do that. Great. And for me personally, I am feeling spring. I would say that that matches my mood. Um, I feel a little under the weather today, um, but in general, I'm just so thankful for like the new beginnings that are cropping up in my life. Um, and so new beginnings makes me think of spring. Super. Um, we have a quiet group today, um, but I will jump in. I actually feel like summer, but probably because it feels like summer <laughs> outside and I'm in short sleeves, do not have to wear a jacket today. Um, you know, so that's that's kind of my uh, where I'm sitting. So uh, somebody uh, winter because I'm tired today. And another response is winter because I love it. <laughs> um oops i feel it's running fast so now all right super all right keep them coming hang on i gotta widen my screen um i feel like winter because the ac in the building is freezing and i'm a little tired um summer because it's super exciting and so much new things especially when we talk about day camps and, and starting to prep for the camp season too so lots of new things coming up but those are the responses jay Nice. Thank you. And thank you everyone for sharing. Feel free to continue to share and to just reflect on how you're feeling, how you're coming into the session. So here's the agenda for our time together. Um, we've already gone through the warm up and uh, I'll just quickly go over some agreements that I like to share at the beginning of sessions. Um, we'll walk through the intended outcomes and then we'll dive into challenging conversations 101. So thinking about what are challenging conversations and exploring equity centered best practices for navigating them. And then we'll dive into some scenarios to think about what we would do in those uh, situations and maybe situations that are similar. And then we will wrap up and close out. So here are some agreements um, that I like to kick off sessions with. Um, and so we may be coming with many different agreements that we use in our own spaces and our own lives. Um, so this set uh, I created and uh, the first letter of um, all of these agreements together spell out growth, which I think is what we're always trying to do. We're always trying to grow, trying to um, become better versions of ourselves. So I encourage us in this session to um, give as much as we can um, in terms of engagement and also to receive um, information that comes from our collective wisdom. Um, I also want to note that Rome was not built in a day, right? So there's no way that one session is going to be able to cover everything um, that we may be wanting to know or we may want to practice around challenging conversations, but that this is one step. Um, I also encourage us to come with open minds and open hearts um, and just also know that, you know, in this session, there are going to be moments in which we are experiencing windows, which means that um, maybe there's an idea that we hadn't thought of before, and maybe there are some ideas that we don't quite agree with. Um, and then there are other times where we're going to see mirrors, right? Where something that you're feeling and something that really resonates will pop up in this session. And so just being open to both those moments and opportunities for windows and mirrors. Um, and then in terms of truth and authenticity, I just encourage us to, you know, um, use I statements and to speak on whatever is true for us um, and that you feel that this is a space where you are able to do that. And last but not least, healthy communication just indicates that we are, you know, respectful of each other's boundaries, right? So there may be moments where you're in a breakout space and you don't quite feel comfortable sharing something in particular. Um, don't, right? There's there's no need to cross any boundaries that you don't feel comfortable crossing. Um, and I think that does take us back to give and receive, right? Um, in those moments where you can give, please do. So here are some of the intended outcomes, and this um, 
way of, uh, I guess, categorizing intended incomes comes from the National Equity Project. So we have practical outcomes and we also have experiential outcomes. So in terms of um, the practical, um, I'm hoping that you'll leave the session being able to define challenging conversations and explore ways to navigate them. And then in terms of experiential outcomes, right, something that I'm hoping that you will feel as you are leaving the session is, you know, a sense of confidence and empowerment in handling difficult conversations and also a renewed sense of ownership and connection to this collective work of educational justice, right? As folks who are working in day camps, you are absolutely educators and you are absolutely on the front lines of uh, educational justice work. So let's jump in. What makes certain conversations challenging? And feel free to either call for mute um, or to drop it into the chat. From the chat, uh, feelings. Yeah. Uh, we don't know the answers. Mm -hmm. That level of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Talking with someone who won't consider your side. Mm -hmm. So that element of being at odds or there being conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, correcting without discouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, how the other person will react. Language and understanding. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Giving bad news. Yeah. This is awesome. Yes, please keep that coming. Um, and you've already hit on a lot of um, what makes conversations challenging or what can make them challenging. So a lot of it is to do with our perspective, right? So a, a conversation may not be challenging for some people, right? Um, and that very same conversation may be challenging for someone else, right? Um, so for example, um, when I was a teacher and I had to have a conversation with one of my colleagues around maybe something that they said or they did and I didn't quite agree with, um, especially when we were co-teachers and when we were needing to be on the same page, I didn't view that as a challenging conversation. Like that was something I felt really comfortable doing, but I know that that colleague having to have that conversation with me sometimes felt nervous, especially if they were in their first year teaching or something like that, or if they weren't sure what the outcome was gonna be, or they weren't even sure if what they were saying was correct, right? So a lot of it does have to do with our perspective. And I think that comes down to like feelings um, and, and those levels of uncertainty and maybe being at odds. So I do want to share um, a definition that may be helpful for us. So in the simplest terms, a challenging conversation is defined as an interaction between two or more parties characterized by um, elevated emotional intensity. So that's getting at the feelings and those feelings may be anger, um, it could be frustration. Um, it could be feeling hurt or sad about something that happened, right? But there's some level of um, emotional intensity. Um, and then there's also the aspect of differing point of views, right? Some sort of disagreement, um, some sort of conflict, right? Uh, and thus, but not least, there's a perceived high stake um, for at least one of the parties, right? So. Uh, if you're the one who is entering into the challenging conversation and you're initiating it, right, you may feel that there's this high stake in, in whatever the outcome is going to be, right? Um, and I think that loops very nicely back to that emotional intensity. So I want to zero in on that um, aspect of challenging conversations having um, to do with conflict, right? Because typically it does, right? Not always, but typically <laughs> um, there's some sort of 
conflict, right? So what's the point in talking about conflict? Number one, it is a fact of life. Um, we're always going to have those moments um, where we may not see eye to eye with someone else, and it's something that we're going to have to address in order to move forward. Um, also, there's a very strong connection between adult conflict and how we handle it as adults, and then how children um, handle their so whether it's us talking through a conflict with a child, right? Let's say, um, uh, I don't know, a child throws a marker across the room, right? This is a situation we need to talk about it, right? And we need to navigate it. Um, and the way that we navigate that conflict with the child is going to impact the way that they handle conflicts moving forward, right? Because we're modeling the way that we talk through those sorts of things. Um, and then also, this can impact workplace quality, right? So if we have conflicts that kind of fester and that aren't being addressed or they're addressed poorly, then that can affect the way that we work together in a space. And again, that will affect um, our students. Um, and then last but certainly, certainly not least, um, we also want to think about our commitment to diversity, belonging, inclusion, and equity, right? Um, and if we are, again, conflicts to kind of fester, not be addressed, or to be addressed poorly, um, then it can affect the way that we are able to or not able to live up to um, the values that we professed around wanting to create spaces in which everyone feels like they belong, everyone feels included, and that we're moving towards a state of equity. And so along those lines, we want to move away from feeling like we have this right to comfort um, and we want to move towards understanding that there can be this generative conflict, right? And so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with um, Tima Okun's work around uh, white supremacist culture, or white dominant culture, but one of those tenets is that right to comfort, right? And then not wanting to engage in uh, conflict and being averse to it. And admittedly, that is something that is just human nature, right? We wanna feel safe and that's understandable. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, the, the neuroscience of that. But what I wanna propose here is that for as much as we can expand beyond our comfort zone, we can actually expand our comfort zone, if that makes sense, right? If we are going into that stretch zone, right? Not the panic zone, but into that stretch zone, then we are able to see like, oh, okay, like I can handle this, right? This is something that is becoming a norm for me. And so your comfort zone in effect starts to expand, right? And so you're able to handle more, and I, I kind of want to bring us back to that anecdote I shared earlier around feeling comfortable with giving my co-teacher feedback, right? Now, it wasn't like that uh, my first year teaching, not at all. I was super nervous, sweating, <laughs> and just like wanting to like brush it like under the carpet. Um, but the more that I was able to give that feedback to my co-teachers over the years, and also able to receive that feedback as well, it became more comfortable for me to do that, right? And so my comfort zone around giving and receiving feedback in effect expanded, right? So again, we want to expand beyond the comfort zone in order to expand the comfort zone. And if you're looking for more around um, just this idea of generative conflict and, and thinking about how conflict can actually help us to grow um, and can help us um, with creating spaces of belonging, um, inclusion, diversity, and equity, uh, there is a piece, um, I'm forgetting the name of the author, but it's called um, Regenerative Qualities. So if you Google that, I find it in there, all of these um, different qualities um, of which uh, one of them is generative conflict, and it's around how we can move towards a more equitable society. All right, so we talked a lot about the why around thinking about conflict. Um, and I want to give us a moment to think about an actual conflict um, of which you were a part. 
And I, I want to ask you to jot as many details as possible about this conflict that you had um, and to just keep that handy during the session so that you can return to it and think about the ways in which you handled that conflict really well and maybe some ways that you could do better if you were given a second opportunity. I also want to flag that um, at some point in the session, we'll go into a breakout space where you can talk a bit about um, this conflict. Um, and so, you know, you want to make sure that this is also a conflict that you feel comfortable talking to a group of people about um, later on in the session. So I will pause just for like 60 seconds so that you have time to jot down as many details about this conflict as possible. We'll take another 10 ish seconds and then we'll keep going. All right. So I want to jump into um, the, the brain and how it kind of functions when we are experiencing a conflict, right? So conflict was around long before the neocortex developed. Um, and typically, you know, um, in these sorts of sessions, I would have like many slides that are talking about the different um, uh, parts of the brain. So the neocortex is the part of the brain that is the least developed, it's the newest, right? Um, and so, the other parts of the brain, um, the reptilian brain, um, the middle brain are much more developed. Um, and those are the parts of the brains that we share with um, other animals. So sometimes people call um, it our like lizard brain. Um, and so conflict has been around since the beginning of time. <laughs> and so if something wanted to eat you and you did not want to be eaten, that was a conflict, right? And so our brain had to work really fast in order for us to survive, right? And the neocortex is the part of our brain um, where like our logic and rationality live, right? Our ability to like take the step back and to like really think about, you know, what's going on, um, how can we move forward? How can we create a plan, right? This is where our executive functioning come in. Um, but our other parts of the brain are much more developed. And so when a conflict arises, those parts of the brains kick into gear um, and are able to react much faster than our neocortex. So for example, right, um, our brain identifies a thing, an animal, or an action, right? And in snap judgment, it is able to judge it as good or bad, right? And then very quickly, it reacts. So, for example, we see blueberries and we think, okay, it's good. And so our reaction is to eat it, right? Um, versus we see this animal, it is a lion, bad, right? It can attack us. And so we run, right? So I'm wondering, and I would love your thoughts, how does this kind of thinking show up in how most people handle our conflict today in modern times? And again, feel free to come off of mute or you can drop it into the chat.
immediately becoming angry and or defensive without listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really great connection, right, to our ability to tap into our neocortex, right? Our neocortex or our prefrontal lobe would tell us, okay, like, let's listen, let's assess, let's try to interpret this differently, right? Versus us getting angry, right? And our limbic system, the middle part of our brain is the seat of our emotions, right? And so that kicks in much more quickly, instantaneously. And so we're feeling this overwhelming sense of like anger, let's say, or hurt, right? And so that may be taking over. And um, when the amygdala is just like, uh, what is predominant, right? In that situation and it's taking over, then the ability for our neocortex to really kick in is diminished, right? And so we go from feeling really angry and shutting down um, to taking that moment and listening. Another comment, uh, Jay, is our previous experiences trigger thoughts. Absolutely, absolutely, right? So, if maybe you've had a conversation with a particular person and it did not go well, then the next time that you need to have a conversation with the person, you're thinking about that last time, right? And so that goes into how you judge the situation and consequently how you might react. Thank you both for that. So we've been kind of talking about this, <laughs> but to make it really explicit, um, what about emotion in all of this, right? We talked about the brain, um, but what about emotion? So a large part of the response to a stimulus, right, is, is emotion, right? And emotion has two main purposes. Um, so one is to produce situation-based reactions, which we talked about, right? So that permission to approach, right, the blueberries, <laughs> um, or this defense mode, right? where we need to run or we need to maybe attack whatever is threatening us, right? Like the lion. And emotion also physically helps us to survive, right? So it can set off the sympathetic nervous system, right? So that's when we start sweating. Um, that's when um, our adrenaline uh, kicks up um, and we're getting ready to, you know, do whatever it is so that we can survive. But also, it can help us with forming relationships, right? So we talk a lot about um, fight, flight, freeze. Um, and the fourth one is fawn, right? So that um, inclination to kind of bond with whoever, you know, the attackers or whatever the threat is in order to build that relationship um, so that the threat is diminished. But also, you could form relationships with people who are your allies against the threat, right? So it can go both ways. Um, and so these are just like the purposes of emotion and how they might show up. So <laughs> all of that being said, are we just like totally out of control and like whatever our brain is doing, especially those like older parts of our brains, those more impulsive parts of our brains, are we just at their mercy? Are we at the mercy of our emotions and those overwhelming emotions in particular? Um, no, not really. So while we can't, you know, instantly control our emotions, we can on a good day control our behavioral reaction to those emotions, right? And again, that's thanks to the prefrontal cortex, right, which is part of the neocortex um, and also the parasympathetic nervous system. So you have the sympathetic nervous system, which is like gearing up to help you to survive and it's, you know, getting you ready for, you know, whatever, you know, you need to do in order to um, self-preserve. Um, and the parasympathetic uh, system is the opposite. It's helping you to a level of stasis, right? So if we're able to tap into the prefrontal cortex and we're also able to tap into the parasympathetic nervous system, then this is all helping us to control how we react to whatever the stimuli are or whatever the threat may be. So once we become aware of our emotions, we can discern their cause, right? 
So this is where, you know, we're getting into that listening, right? We're getting into um, thinking about, okay, like, am I interpreting the situation in a way that is helpful, that is getting us to a positive outcome, or am I allowing my emotions to just run rapid, right? And then we can engage our prefrontal cortex and we can slowly influence the limbic system, right? Our emotions to reinterpret the data. So I know that that was a lot. So I will pause here in case there are any questions. Um, I'm not like a trained neuroscientist, <laughs> um, but I, you know, something that really helped me with thinking through this was understanding what is going on in my body um, and my brain. And that really helps me to be compassionate, but it also helps me to navigate what I want to do next. Um, so hopefully just like understanding that neuroscience um, can be helpful for being compassionate with yourself and also thinking about how you want to proceed whenever you're in these situations. So I'm gonna keep going, but again, if there are any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. So there are six core principles of conflict. One is that conflict is natural, it is normal, and it is deeply human, right? Um, conflict is the work, it is not a distraction from the work, right? So again, um, going back to the anecdote that I shared earlier with my co-teachers, I knew that, you know, having a conflict with them, you know, it, it was so important for us and our relationship, but also for our students that we handled whatever the conflict was, right? Um, and not thinking that, you know, it's a distraction from the work, like, let's just like get in front of these kids and teach, right? But rather, this is a part of what it means to be a teacher is that, you know, if something comes up with my co teacher, that we talk about it and that we address it um, and we're able to move forward stronger. Um, conflict is almost always reciprocal, right? So, um, and, I, and I think that it kind of goes into the next one, which is conflict exists if someone says it does, right? So, it, it typically takes two to tango. <laughs> And so even if you didn't think that there was a conflict, if someone else thinks that there's a conflict, then you want to take it seriously and you want to engage in that conversation. Um, conflict is sustained by win-lose, right-wrong, binary thinking, right? So as much as we can come to that middle ground um, and meet each other there, then we're able to lessen the conflict instead of it being this like tug of war and only one person can be right. Um, and last but not least, conflict is our teacher, if we allow it to be. So this is the part where we're going to get into those uh, breakout spaces, um, and you'll be with maybe four other people in that space. Um, and this is the time where you will be reviewing your conflict. So some questions to consider, and feel free to take pictures of this slide, um, just so that you have the uh, prompts when you go into your breakout space. Whose perspective did your words reflect the most, right? When you were thinking about the conflict, um, was it your perspective that you wrote about? Did you include some of the other person's perspective? Um, did you spend more time on the emotional experience of the conflict? Or did you think more about the outcome of the conflict? Did you focus more on the intent or the impact? And what was your comfort level when you were in the conflict, right? Were you fully immersed in that moment? Or were you kind of like hurrying to just like get the conversation over with so that you could leave? So you'll spend about 10 minutes in these breakout spaces. Um, and then when we come back together, you're welcome to share a little bit about what you talked about in the space, um, but you you don't have to if you just want to, you know, keep it in the space. Um, and as I said before, um, in our agreements, share as much as you would like um, and also just be open to um, whatever other people in your space say. So we'll see you in about 10 minutes. 
All right. Well, I hope that that time to, you know, dive into the conflict that you've been thinking about was helpful. Um, and I will just like pause for about 30 seconds in case anyone wants to share um, any trends that came up um, or any personal thoughts that came up. Um, you can do that in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, interestingly enough, in our uh, breakout room, all three of us had conflicts that ended up not being resolved. Um, and ironically, between um, the three of us in each one of our different scenarios, the other party wasn't willing to like help to sort of resolve it. Like one of for one of us, like they really weren't listening. They kept coming back with different things, but really wasn't listening to what they were saying. Um, or would like say, um, like in my case, they would say like one thing when we're meeting together and talk about it, but then when we'd leave the meeting, it would be a whole nother story. And no matter how much I was like trying to be like, let's get on the same page and try to figure out what this was, not getting that sort of response like back from them. So you kind of left like, okay, I don't know what to do now to end it. And you're trying all these different things and nothing seems to be working because the other party wasn't being receptive. And um, for the other uh, lady that was in with us, um, she would do it when like she wasn't around, you know, and was, you know, so that made it harder too because she couldn't put, you can't pinpointly say you're like doing X, Y, Z because in a way it's sort of like hearsay, if you will. So sort of that going around, hopefully that kind of summed us all up together. But I just thought it was kind of interesting that all three of us were kind of in sort of a similar um, boat, so to speak. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. and. Something that really pops out from what you shared is this idea that like sometimes it's it's not just going to take one conversation and sometimes it's not just going to take one conversation with you, right? Um, and there are going to be moments where like A, the other person is not going to be receptive, as you noted, or they'll be sort of receptive, but sort of not, right? And so there are going to be times where they're agreeing to whatever it is that y'all talked about, and there are going to be times where they don't, right? Um, and so thinking about when is it that opportunity or when is it that moment where you're like looping in other people who need to be involved um, and also thinking about, you know, what is, I guess, the best trajectory, right? It's like, here's this initial conversation. Do we need to schedule a check-in? Do we need to make sure that like there's some sort of accountability measure that's like baked in? Um, and do you have the authority um, to like be able to bake in that sort of accountability or is it somebody else that needs to be looped, right? Um, and so there are just so many different pieces um, that we need to consider when we're thinking about particular, you know, complex or challenging conversations. And I think that you touched on a lot of the reality of it. So thank you. And so I think that that brings us to, and we're we're gonna dive into all of that <laughs> in a moment. I mean, I think that that brings us to um, just like how are we, I guess, showing up um, in these sorts of spaces when we are engaging in conflict, when we're engaging in these sorts of challenging conversations. So I wanna invite you to drop into the chat. What are some essential attitudes for engaging in conflict? Pretty quiet group, Jay. Oh, here we go. Sometimes we're already defensive. Willingness to listen. Um, patience is really important, especially because you mentioned like that it won't always solve with one conversation, that like our logical brain takes a longer to like function than the the lizard brain. So patience with like ourselves and patience with the other people. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, and a lot of what's coming up in the chat is is great, right? 
So one, like I, I saw in the chat, um, like this openness to criticism, right? That's hard. Like, I'm going to be real. Like, that's hard for me. Like, when someone tells me that I've done something that is like wrong or I made them feel a particular way, like, I get defensive, right? Um, and that's like in the workplace, that is like with my partner, <laughs> that is like when I'm driving, right? Like, whatever the situation, right? And so I think that this, um, and that's not to like let me off the hook. It's like, oh, well, Jay's going to get defensive, so I'm not even going to bring this up to her. Like, that's not what I'm suggesting. Um, it's important for me to know that about myself. And it's also important for me to extend that understanding to other people, too. And I think that's where patience also comes in and just like this ability to see like, oh, OK, like if I understand that this is how like I react to things sometimes and like I don't always mean to act like that, then could that be true for them too? And like, how can I be patient as they're figuring this out, right? Without letting them off the hook. Um, and also how can I use what I know about what's going on in our brains and our bodies to also be, you know, understanding about what's coming up for them, right? Um, and I think that there's this level of emotional intelligence um, that we have and this level of empathy that we have and being able to read other people's body language, right? Um, and seeing like, hey, maybe this is a moment where we need to take a break. Or maybe this is a moment where I need to maybe call out exactly what I'm seeing. Like, hey, like, as we're having this conversation, I notice that, you know, your arms are crossed and you're not really looking at me anymore. Like, what's coming up for you? Should we take a break? Um, do you want to talk about how you're feeling right now? Is there a way that we can turn this around so that it's more productive? Um, and just letting them know that you see them, right? Um, and maybe that'll help them to like let their guard down a little bit and be more receptive to what you're saying, right? So I, it's complicated. And, and, and having the capacity to do that, I think is sometimes easier with our students, right? I look at a child and I'm like, oh, like, you know, they're getting pouty or like maybe we need to take a break or like, you know, you know, their brain is not developed. And of course they're, you know, they're, they're getting riled up. And so like, you know, let me try a different approach with them, right? We're just more, I think, compassionate with children um, when it comes to like helping them navigate conflict. But then when I'm with someone who is my age or older, I'm like, you should know better, right? Or like, I'm going to just like bypass the fact that you feel upset because we need to talk about this and you need to do better. Right. And so maybe, maybe, maybe that's not the best approach. Right. And maybe how can we just like empathize with the fact that like as humans, this can be challenging no matter how old you are, or even if you know better. Right. Um, and again, that can be challenging and that can be difficult and a lot of emotional labor for us. But I think that the calls for you to think about why you're engaging in this conflict in the first place, right? And if it's really important for you to engage, then how much are you willing to do a little bit of that emotional labor on the front end for, you know, some sort of outcome that presumably moves us towards a better us, a better working relationship, a better environment, a better camp, a better experience for the kids, right? Um, and, the, you know, the last thing I'll say about that is we also want to be really hyper aware of burnout, right? And, and languishing, as Adam Grant calls it, and there's one other term, but just this feeling of like compassion fatigue, and, you know, and so I want to be empathetic to that as well. And I understand that that's a real thing that we can experience, especially when we're putting in so much emotional labor. Um, and so we want to guard against that. And that's a whole other session, right? Um, but I, I definitely want to acknowledge that. Um, and it, it, I just want to acknowledge that like it's a dance, right? And I can't prescribe anything that's going to like work for everyone. Um, but the more that we're thinking about this and the more that we're like testing things out for ourselves, we can start to see like, okay, here's my boundary. You know, here's how much I can tolerate in this moment. Here's why it's important. Here's where maybe I need to tap out. Um, and so hopefully um, the more that we're thinking about this, the easier it is for us to like 
engage in challenging conversations in a way that's productive for you and for the other party, right? So just very quickly, some essential attitudes um, for engaging in conflict can be that non-judgmental reflection. So taking those moments to really think about what is going on um, for what it is without judgment, right? So instead of saying like, oh my gosh, this person is like doing it again. And like, why can't they understand? More of a, okay, I'm noticing that this person is X, right? Something more non-judgmental, which can actually help you to think about what to do next, right? Tapping into that prefrontal cortex. You wanna go in with a humble curiosity. Um, sometimes it's just so helpful to ask more questions um, then you try to give responses. And someone earlier mentioned that like part of what can make a challenging conversation challenging is that like we don't really know what the answer is. And that's okay. I always say like, I may not have the answers, but I got your questions. <laughs> and together through that curiosity, maybe we can come to like answers together. Um, something else that can be helpful is like bringing in some humor, right? So it's like, oh, like, <laughs> you know better, right? And so sometimes that self-efficacy humor can help to like bring it down for yourself. Um, and I know when I say stuff like that to myself, it's just like, okay, I'm like, Jay, you're doing it again. Like, you know, this is checking off the box. Jay's getting defensive, right? And it helps me to calm down and also help me to be compassionate with myself. And that helps me to like further engage in that moment of conflict. And last but not least, accepting that imperfection, right? So moving us from a place of a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, right? Um, and knowing that um, even if we stumble along the way, we can get better. And even if the other person stumbles along the way, they too have the capacity to get better. So I think this is the moment that we've been waiting for, right? It's like really getting into those best practices. Um, and some of them I kind of brought up already, and I'm sure that you brought up as well um, when you were in your breakout rooms. So I like to think about it as engaging in four steps, right? So we start at the bottom of the staircase, right? Um, and so the most, um, uh, I guess, important thing that we can do is start with our own individual work, right? Um, and that's something that's happening all of the time, right? That's ongoing, um, even when you're not necessarily gearing up for some sort of challenging conversation. And then we go into those moments where there is a conflict like that has been identified. And so now you're thinking about how do you create those collaborative logistics? Then we go into actually having the conversation, right? So there are two steps before we even get to the conversation. Um, and then there's some best practices for how we engage in that. And then after the conversation, we want to think about how we are healing ourselves and then how we are following up with others. And again, the cycle continues, right? So in terms of individual work, we want to make sure that we are checking our purposes. Um, so as I mentioned before, like, why are you about to engage in this conversation, right? And I just want to preface that a lot of this is from the perspective of like you being the person who is initiating the challenging conversation. Of course, if someone else is initiating it and inviting you into it, um, you can still do these things. Um, but it, you know, the the framing would be a little bit different. Um, but that being said, <laughs> you want to go in making sure that you check your purpose, right? So you know. Why do I perceive this as a conflict? Is it really even a conflict? Is it something that like, you know, we always talk about choosing our battles. Like is, you know, my partner teacher leaving the lights on at the end of the work day and like me coming in the next day and seeing that the lights have been on all night. Like that's something that hurts me from like a sustainability point of view, but like, how much of a conflict is this? Are there like bigger things that we need to tackle first? I don't know, right? So we just wanna check our purposes um, for like even engaging in this conversation. You wanna ground your identity, right? And think about who are you in the situation? Maybe what baggage are you bringing? What past experiences are you bringing to this situation in, in 
in conjunction with um, other identity factors, right? Like, are you noticing that like you are male bodied um, and the person that you're about to talk to is female bodied or, you know, maybe you are someone who is of color and you're about to talk to someone who is white and like, how are those dynamics playing out in the situation? So you want to make sure that you're really like grounding yourself in those moments um, because you don't want to enter the conversation and your emotions start getting out of whack and you're not sure why. And maybe it is something related to identity that maybe if you had thought about before, you could like name it in the moment, right? Um, or maybe it's something that um, you could plan for and make sure that you're being like, um, just like aware of that dynamic and making sure that you're creating a space that's more equitable, especially if you're the one who is of the dominant space. So like with children as adults, we need to take into account that like we hold a lot of power in, in in a space and a child may not feel comfortable talking to us about certain things or in a certain way because maybe they are scared that of like what we're going to do because we do have power right so all of these things could play into it you want to take it into it, uh, account before you enter a conversation uh, you want to understand what your emotional stake is in the situation and what your emotional state is in the situation as well. Um, and you also want to own your story. What story are you telling yourself about what's going on? And also be prepared to expand the story, right? So going off of that, I want to share this framework um, that was developed by Dr. Yolanda Sealy Huis. Um, she is a professor at uh, Teachers College Columbia University. And um, in particular, she talks about the archaeology itself. And you can see that here um, in the orange band. And that's this deep excavation and exploration of beliefs, biases, and ideas that shape how we engage in the work. So in thinking about an archaeology of self, like this is that opportunity where you are doing that individual deep dive work, right? And some questions that you can use when you're thinking about that kind of like work and understanding yourself and who you are in a situation are where do certain issues live in me, right? Um, I know that like I can get defensive and a lot of that comes from some insecurities that I have around being like one of the youngest people at my organization, for example, right? And so I've got to know that like that is living in me and that's something that I need to, to, to recognize and something that I may need to handle, right? And then bring to light. Who am I in this situation? Um, who am I in this particular work that we are doing, right? If we're thinking about the grand scheme of things. What am I learning about myself and about the kind of person that I am or that I want to become through having this conversation? And then also, why have I chosen this path, right? So again, thinking about purpose. Uh, and feel free, you know, take a picture of this, um, but also you can return to the recording because I think these questions are really powerful when you actually sit down um, and think about it. Sorry, my phone is like connected to my laptop. Okay. So moving into the collaborative logistics. So you wanna make sure that as you are about to have this conversation with the person or people, that you have your points ready and you have the purpose clearly defined for the conversation. Um, and you want to plan for plenty of time. You know, I know, like, you know, there are some conversations where, you know, you can have them and it's like an in and out situation. Like you kind of have that dynamic with the person, but especially when you don't have that kind of dynamic or rapport with the person, you want to plan for plenty of time. And if you know you're only going to get, let's say, 30 minutes because that person's busy or you're busy, that like you plan for like that check in time later on. Um, you want to clarify shared expectations for that space, right? So, you know, some people do like they have like a safe word or like we're gonna like pass around like the like that little ball and whoever has the ball is speaking, like whatever the shared expectations for your space are, just make sure that you all know what they are. Um, and then you want to establish safe and neutral grounds for the conversation, right? 
Uh, so you want to typically have conversations that are challenging one to one. Um, you also want to do it somewhere maybe that's like a little public, um, like um, on the play yard or just like, I don't know, in a cafe, right? So it's like one to one, like it's not a bunch of people around necessarily, but you also don't want to be like too isolated because that can like set up a dynamic that may feel unsafe for the other person if they feel like they need to like step away or if you feel like you need to step away. Um, and just a reminder that like clear is kind, right? That comes from Brene Brown. Um, but as much as you can be clear about what's about to happen um, with you and the other person, that can bring down levels of anxiety. So the conversation. So we wanna start with talking about the facts of what happened, right? Um, and you want this to be as like non-judgmental as possible. Then you want to loop your way through the conflict, right? So after you've stated what happened um, and like how you perceive it, right, using I statements, then you want to inquire, right? Get more of their perspective, get more of like what they think is going on, get more on like what y'all can do next, right? And so approaching with that curiosity. And then you want to make sure that you're listening, right? And that's come out multiple times in this session, right? Is that willingness to listen. And you're listening not to respond to the person. You're listening so that you can potentially paraphrase what they just said, which is so powerful to let someone know that you heard them, right? And you're able to put it into your own words. And you're also listening to understand what they are saying, right? So it's not listen so that I can come back with like, my comeback, <laughs> um, because then that's not really getting us to a place of um, a solution or some sort of resolution. And I also want to make the distinction between acknowledging what someone is saying and agreeing with what they're saying, right? So I think that there's, and, and I have it too, especially when I'm in a disagreement that's like kind of hot, like hot, you know, and, and passionate. I don't even want to nod my head yes or like give anything affirming to the person because I don't want them to think that I agree with them. Um, but you can say something like, yeah, I hear what you're saying, or oh, I, I can see where you're coming from with that one, right? And that's acknowledging what they're saying, but you are not agreeing. You're not literally saying, oh yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, but even if you do say you agree, you can also say like, I agree with this, but I still disagree with that, right? Um, but I think, again, acknowledging what someone is saying is super powerful. Um, and I relate some alternative perspectives, right? Maybe your perspective is not the only perspective. It usually isn't, right? Um, and so, you know, making sure that all perspectives, as many as possible, are being brought to the table in that moment. Um, and then consider how um, different factors have contributed to this conflict. Um, but avoid blame and shame because that will just cause the other person to just shut down furthermore um, and it's just not helpful. And even if you feel like you are correct, blaming the person, shaming the person, it just usually doesn't work, right? And of course, there are always like exceptions to any rule, um, but for the most part, we try to um, not bring that into the space. Um, and whenever you need to, take a break and take a breath, both of you. So now we're getting to the point where we are doing that healing work and we are following up. So after the conversation, like let's say you've had the full conversation, or even if you've had a little bit of the conversation, and y'all realize like this is not the time to have the conversation, or we need to come back to this because it's like, bigger than we thought it was or emotions are like taking over. You want to go back to that individual work, right? So like checking in with yourself, how are you doing? You know, what's your emotional state right now? Um, you know, what is your purpose in continuing this conversation? You just want to ground yourself in yourself. Um, and then you want to go back to step three, which was the conversation, right? Like, how did that go? Are there other people that I need to loop in right now? Um, and then you want to re-engage in step two, which is the collaborative logistics. 
um, and pursue another conversation. And maybe again, that is with you and the other person, maybe it's you, another person, and the person like a mediator. Um, maybe sometimes you are not the person to have the conversation and it'll just be between like the other person that who's stepping in and the person with whom the conflict exists. Um, so something I can think of is like, uh, maybe it's your boss who needs to have a conversation with that person. And at this point, like you've done what you could and you're stepping out of you know that space of having the conversation. Um, and then for as much as you can follow up, it's always great, right? So um, some talking points are, I'm wondering how our compromise or agreement is working out for you. Here's how I'm feeling about it. Or would you like to revisit our last conversation? Um, or it could be, I'm noticing that you did this thing that we had talked about, and I'm really excited about it. And I'm so happy you did it. I appreciate our partnership. So some tips for engaging in conflict, just like some quick things to like uh, end this section on. So you want to make sure that the environment is non-threatening as possible. So when I talk about environment, I mean your internal environment, right? So again, making sure that you're grounding yourself, something that could be helpful is meditation. I meditate every day. Um, and that's a big part of my life and keeping myself like equanimous. Um, but that could mean anything for you. Just make sure you're taking care of your internal state before you engage in um, a conflict and while you're engaging in it, of course. Then you also want to think about the external environment, right? So how are you looping in your support system? How are you making sure that like you're in a space where, you know, it's neutral and it's safe for the both of you, things like that. Um, and then you want to digest and process information in manageable chunks. And as you are digesting and processing, you want to continually ask yourself, what story am I telling myself about whatever the thing is? And then you want to prepare for negative emotion, right? People are going to get defensive. You might get defensive. People may storm off. People may say, like, I don't want to talk about this right now, or like, I don't know why we're talking about this. It's not a problem for me, right? Um, and just know that that is probably going to happen, especially if you know that person and that's how they operate. Um, so you want to prepare for that sort of um, reaction. Um, I'm not suggesting that you be okay with aggressive behavior like yelling or anything physical, that's not okay. And that is definitely crossing the boundary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also not suggesting that you need to prepare for this over and over and over again. If you notice that someone is constantly not engaging in a way that's productive, then that's when you need to figure out, like, am I burning myself out? Not worth it? Um, is there someone else who can step in? Is this an environment that I need to be in? Is this aligned with my values, right? And so, of course, there are boundaries for all of this. But assuming that you are in a place to engage and where that emotional labor is not too taxing, you want to be able to hold space for whatever negative emotions may come up. And just a reminder, right? Like, a sense of calm and care is so helpful, um, and that takes time to cultivate um, and, and to really build up that resiliency. And sometimes we're unable to like bring that forth, and, and, and that is okay, right? We want to be compassionate with ourselves and know when it's time for us to take a break. So, here are some scenarios. Firstly, I know I said a lot. So if there are any questions, comments, reactions, please feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, but I wanna go through some scenarios and just like show how we can put a lot of this theory into practice. So here's one scenario, self to student. Um, and so you'll see on the slide, I have two laptops up, so that's why I'm looking off to the side. Okay. So, so someone graffiti the bathroom stall, and rumor has it that AJ did it. So many of the kids are talking about it, but there's no direct evidence to link AJ to the graffiti. 
um, and you want to find out if AJ is involved. However, you recognize that he is the only Latinx student in the, in the group, and you don't want to play into any stereotypes or make AJ feel singled out, especially if he didn't do it. So what would you do in this situation? So uh, feel free to drop ideas into the chat. But I want to offer um, some like quick points on how something like this could be managed based off of the four steps. So you want to check your purpose, right? Why does it matter if AJ did it or someone else did it, right? And that may seem like, well, of course it matters. You know, we want to make sure that he's held accountable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but really, why does it matter? Or do we just need to like clean it off and like tell everyone like, hey, it's not okay to like deface the bathroom and things like that and we can move forward, right? Um, but let's say you really do feel passionately or like the whole leadership team feels really passionately about making sure that whoever did is held accountable. You just want to ground yourself in your purpose, right? So we always want to start there. Um, and then you want to think about your own identity, right? Personally, I am a Latina. And so, you know, I would feel comfortable like as a Latina woman talking to AJ as a, La a Latinx student. Um, but maybe if you don't feel comfortable around that, maybe you want to like ask other people like, hey, like, how would you handle the situation? What do you think about this? You want to leverage your support ecosystem, right? Um, so just thinking about your identity. Um, and here it can be racially, but also like I'm the student, and I have to think about that dynamic as well. So you want to set up safe and neutral grounds, right? So when I'm talking to AJ, if I decide that that's what I want to do, I want to make sure that we're, you know, one to one so that, you know, I'm not publicly talking about the situation um, in front of other people who don't need to have access <laughs> to this conversation. Um, but I want to do it somewhere where like they feel comfortable. So maybe it's like at a part of the play yard or like maybe off to the side in the lunchroom where it's still public. AJ can walk up if they need to. Um, I feel I know that I can walk up if I need to. Um, it's like the safe, neutral ground for the conversation, but it is one on one. Something else that I would think about is think about like what are my points and uh, that I'm coming to this conversation with. So. Um, there's graffiti in the bathroom. This is me talking about, you know, what happened, right? In non-judgmental terms. There's graffiti in the bathroom. And the rumor that I've heard is that you, AJ, are the one who graffitied the bathroom. Have you also seen this graffiti? Have you heard, you know, that your name floating around? Like, how do you feel about that? Did you, in fact, do it? Um, it's important that we, you know, keep the space clean. Um, just as a community out of respect, but also because now the janitor has to do this work of like scrubbing this off at the same time that the janitor is also trying to keep us during these COVID times, right? So can you understand that like there are multiple reasons why we can't have this happening, right? And so you want to have this conversation. You want to be at eye level with AJ. You don't want to be towering over the person. You don't want them towering over you. So you want to sit you know, kind of like eye level. And just like share your points, right? You want to make sure that your voice is level and that it's calm, right? And you want to pause and make sure that they have the ability to really interact with you. Um, and so if in fact AJ is the one that did it, then we talk about, okay, what can we do moving forward, right? So, so maybe there's already like a system in place for what to do. Um, but if not, then like you can get creative, like, okay, since you did it, you're the one who's going to have to clean it. Um, and like maybe the janitor, you know, give them supplies and, and you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and honestly, like maybe the lady looks great. And so like maybe there's a way that like AJ can be a part of a mural that y'all are trying to create, right? So you're you're starting even to get into that healing and to that follow-up, right? You want to make sure that your relationship with the person is good. Um, so that's sort of like how I would, you know, handle it, loop in whoever else needs to be looped in, um, especially if it's like, you know, the leadership team or AJ's parents or whatever the case may be. Um, 
and check in on AJ and make sure that like any repairing of your relationship happens um, and that they know that you're not holding it against them, especially since they're a child um, and you want to move forward in a way that's productive, right? Um, so that's just one example using the four um, steps. So here we have a scenario where it's you and like a colleague, right? So self to peer. So one of your colleagues, Sam, is very well liked on the team. Um, that says she is constantly making disparaging remarks about children, their families, and even other staff members. Um, and she gets away with it because she's joking. Other people laugh at Sam's jokes, but you find it very offensive and it seems to go against the DEI values of the program. You don't want to be perceived as overly sensitive or a wet blanket. You start to question if you are, since everyone else laughs at the jokes. What would you do? So again, feel free to drop anything into the chat, but I'm just going to walk through um, some ideas. So, you know, in this situation, something that pops up for me is around like your emotional stake and state, right? So you want to feel this sense of belonging with your colleagues, right? Like you don't want to be this wet blanket, um, but you also just, you know, you feel really uncomfortable about what the person is saying, right? Um, and you also just like perceive this as being like antithetical to the DEI values, right? So there are a lot of emotions coming up that you want to process. Um, and understand as much as you can before you answer the situation. So you also want to think about the story that you're telling yourself. So other people are laughing, but that doesn't mean that they think it's okay. Maybe they're also just going along with it and they don't want to rock the boat, right? Um, and maybe Sam doesn't know that what she's saying is making people feel uncomfortable or that it's offensive. So there are many ways you could handle this. This could be an HR moment, right? Um, if you feel comfortable talking to Sam one-on-one, -on -one, you can do that, right? And have that uh, conversation. And so again, just saying like, hey, Sam, you said this thing um, and I felt like this when you said it. Um, now that you've heard like how it impacted me, like I'm curious about what your intentions are, what your thoughts are. Um, how do you think we can move forward on that? And again, Sam may be really receptive or not, right? And so at that moment, it's like, okay, like I noticed that, you know, you don't seem to really be receptive to what I'm saying. Um, you know, is this a conversation that we can continue? Um, and just seeing like, maybe she just needs to take a break and come back to you. Maybe it is something that you need to bring to like someone else who's of a higher authority, right? Um, and so there are a lot of ways that you can take this. Um, but, and I think that it very much depends on how much the person is engaging with you. Let's say that she is really receptive to what you're talking about. Um, then maybe, you know, she's just like, hey, like, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't mean for that to happen. You acknowledge. I appreciate that. Like, I'm sure you didn't mean to do that. People were laughing. And so you kept going. That makes sense. Like, I make jokes and people laugh and I keep going. Um, but I do think that it's against our DEI values. So maybe like those disparaging jokes could not happen anymore. Right. Um, and then you like follow up with her. Right. Um, and you also check in with yourself after the conversation. Um, so that's a bit of what I would do and how I would tackle that. All right. And here's the last one, which I'm not going to go through um, in terms of the steps, because I know that we're about like three minutes away from ending, but I do want to read it out loud and it's something that you can think about. So the leadership team is preparing for the next budget meeting. You learn that your program is set to receive less funding next fiscal year. You're losing funding because the leadership team doesn't think your program is engaging enough, but you need the funding to improve the program. You are frustrated and disheartened. You want to have a conversation with the program director, but you are unsure of yourself because this is only your second year on the team and your colleagues warned you that the program director does not take kindly to push back. What would you do? Right? How can you use the four steps um, to navigate this situation? So I do want to open it up in case there are any questions. 
Um, but before that, I just want to leave us um, with some, you know, uh, prompts for reflection. So what are two to three key takeaways that you'll remember and act upon? And then with whom can you share this information um, with so that you are strengthening your understanding and so that you're holding yourself accountable? And then just so that you can see here on the screen, here are the intended outcomes, and I hope that we were able to achieve them. I also want to um, put the uh, link into the chat. Kathy, if you can put the link in um, for the survey. Um, and I really appreciate your feedback. Um, and I'm also offering a free coaching session to anyone who wants it. So just contact me. Um, you have my website um, listed here. You also have my email and then my Instagram handle. Um, so again, if you would like a free coaching session, it's one on one, 30 minutes, you're welcome to it. So just let me know. Um, so I'm going to go back. Well, I'll take a picture of this. Please fill out the survey. And then um, I'll return to this slide in case there are any questions um, that I can field. Super. And while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Jay, I'm just going to do a quick follow up if you're good with that. Yes. OK, super. And th Jay, thank you so much. This was really exceptionally helpful information um, that hopefully will help guide, you know, our participants to, to having those in, right. No one likes conflict. Well, some people like conflict, but um, it's it's one of those things. So thank you so much. If you all have further questions regarding today's webinar, um, please email the Wisconsin After School Network at the email address provided in the chat box. Thank you, Sarah. More information about a series of professional development opportunities in addition to this learning series can be found on the Wisconsin After School Network website, and that web address is also posted. Our next and last this year will be next Wednesday, May 18th from 10 to 11.30 a.m. Our speaker is Dr. Teresa Tucker from Clemson University. Teresa's presentation will focus on creative programming in camp and is titled Reinventing the Wheel Creative Day Camp Programming. We encourage you to participate in this discussion as we all continue to work to provide quality out of school time opportunities for kids and families. And Jay, you'll stay on the line for a short while. Um, if you want to talk directly one on one, does that work for you? Yeah, that works. Super. And then for the rest of you, thank you for your participation in today's webinar and for the work you do on behalf of the children and families in the state of Wisconsin. Have a good day. Enjoy that nice weather. <laughs>